Hello everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on postmodernism and popular culture. So postmodernism is a term that's thrown around a lot and I don't know that I could fully define it in this mini lecture in all the ways in which it's been defined but we are going to look at, at it in a way in which helps us think about popular culture. And it post, with regards to postmodernism, it aims to understand how powerful a role that mass media and popular culture have taken on in the 20th and 21st century. And again, to borrow from Dominic Strinati's introduction of theories of popular culture, mass media and popular culture are the most important and powerful institutions in control and shape all other types of social relationships. That is, they are involved or they create meaning for us in all different types of ways. This is true in how we perceive what a, you know, what we think of of weddings, of what we think of of what it means to be boyfriend and girlfriend or what it means to work at a job you like or work at a job you hate, what it means to have good family relationships, have bad family relationships. Right? We can look at a show like Married with Children and say, "Look, there's an example of bad family dynamics." Or depending on your point of view, really good family dynamics. And so part of where postmodernism gets really interesting or, or can get problematic depending on your view is that we define ourselves based upon the signs and, symbol, uh, signs and symbols we're exposed to from popular culture. And in doing so, we become a reflection of a reflection. Right? So popular culture creates stories and narratives that are somehow representative or reflect or embody ideas from culture as a whole. And then we, as consumers of popular culture, try to define ourselves based upon those signs and symbols. So it can get very confusing, it can get very chaotic, uh, and it can raise one, you know, it can raise questions about what it means to believe or be something within popular culture. What does it mean to be a fan? What does it mean to have certain identities? Are you, you know, we, we, we lose what I would call what we think of as genuineness, or at least postmodernism asks if there is such thing as genuineness of identity, right? Are you genuinely a person that identifies as X, or are you, you know, reflecting what's been reflected to you? So one of the ways, one of the big things that has happened in the 20th century is we've shifted from production to consumption. That is, our economy strives around consumption, not just production and making goods, but an overwhelming amount of consumption, more consumption than is ever really needed, but that's part of our identity. It's as equally important as production. And a good example of that is after, right after 9-11, one of Bush's first speeches was telling people to go back to the malls not to do any, you know, the, the idea that that is what he wanted people to do, that is where he wanted people, is, is, is a striking, you know, point to be aware of, of that idea of we are buyers, we are consumers, just as much as we are producers, or, or even more so. Many of us now consume lots, but actually produce very little. Uh, some of us, you know, never actually produce any physical goods in our life. Uh, that just is never a job or an occupation. So uh, what we do is we provide services and such, but we're largely consumers in the bigger picture. So what we see is that ways of existing within culture largely come from consumption in popular culture. That is, how we understand what we should do and how we should do it are often we are led to those conclusions by the popular culture that we engage with as well as just from consuming itself, you know, from the act of consumption itself. And I think this is important, you know, I, and I think there's, there's elements of truth here if we look at just certain things that we engage in, right? Dating is no longer, or, or in order to date, there is consumption required, right? If you, more often, I would say the vast majority of dates usually start with going to dinner or doing dinner in a movie or doing something in which it's usually occurs you know in some some place where money is going to be spent not that money needs to be spent but at the same time there are expectations around dating and spending money holidays 
in here we have you know uh, Black Friday and the idea of this actually you know this is a consumer holiday there's no other it, it is a artificially created and it's you know it's uh, I guess it's sister holiday Cyber Monday right or you know, what is it Small Business Saturday right we're creating the, these holidays that are solely focused on purchasing uh, some would argue that things like Valentine's Day is another one that is a consumer holiday. It's It's been created and it's ritualized for the purpose of consuming. And then we also see in employment that in order to exist, in order to work at many jobs, you need to consume. You need to have certain goods right you need to make sure you uh, you know have the proper clothing uh, depending on where you work you might also need to make sure you have proper access to transportation uh, you need to be pro you know you need proper physical and social appearance so you need to be trimmed or you know you need to have your um, you need to look aesthetically acceptable you can't in many places of employment they would not appreciate or there would be problems if you came in with you know your hair all disheveled maybe your you know uh, just piece, you know pieces of food hanging off your face right there there's certain expectations around appearance around how you act in many of these we learn from the popular culture at large we learn about these are the acceptable habits and rituals to which you must do and so what we start to see is that this that surface and style dominate right that we we like the idea of a place like IKEA where we essentially can get new uh, you know a, a new bedroom set every couple years because they're not meant to last that long right through planned obsolescence which is this purpose you know companies making sure that their their goods only last so long right that it now becomes um you know it's no longer purchasing something so that you have it forever it's purchasing even though it's something that you could technically or should technically have forever such as a couch it's now you're purchasing a couch to you know for the next few years and then you're going to disregard it and find the new style right we see this most particularly with fashion and people accumulating clothes getting rid of clothes accumulating clothes getting rid of clothes even though the clothes themselves have nothing wrong with them and we really do pr you know we, we become a culture that starts to privilege style over function and so we see these with sagging pants, right? That people wear, and in, you know, there's even brands now that make that make them appear saggy, but then they're still hooked at the hip. We see it with elaborate and ornate shoes. Uh, I mean, high heels. There's no reason to wear high heels. Uh, in fact, there's all sorts of problems that it does. It, it actually does to a person who wears high heels, but it's a style and it's a style that we will you know that we privilege despite that its function actually does us harm SUVs many people own SUVs and there's no reason to own an SUV uh, for most people there's no substantial reason and yet they'll own them because again it's a style choice in that within postmodernism we see within the the last hundred years this drive to prefer style over function now, mass culture theory, when we went back much earlier, we looked at this, mass culture theory was scared of this. They saw this as the downfall of society. But postmodernists, or people who study post popular culture through postmodernism, they are intrigued by this. This is fascinating to them in the ways in which, you know, things like style or privilege or the ways in which we define ourselves by popular culture's reflection of what we are supposed to be. We also see in the rise of post uh, of postmodernism that we're living in a relativistic world, and that means meta narratives become less domineering and relevant. That is, this relativistic world is is one in which meaning is made in relation to where you are and who you are connected to, and you know what popular culture you are exposed to. And meta narratives, just to clarify, these are theories that attempt to explain the course of history. That is, putting all narratives into one large, you know, one large narrative. Uh, these become less possible. Marxism is a meta narrative, but in a postmodernist world, Marxism doesn't work, or it just, the, it's less relevant. It's less useful. It's less. Um, 
able to exist or to be seen as a viable as a viable theory and so this idea within postmodernism of that relativistic world and, and this decrease on the, the reliance of meta narratives is we ultimately get to there are absolutely no absolutes that everything is in in conjunction or in connection with one another where it sits within the culture where it sits within the world and so what we end up with is this rise of the multiple self right and many of us feel like or many of us have been in that situation where uh, I'm talking to myself or feeling like we have many different hats many different identities depending on the context in which we are and so this is part of that idea this is that those competing identities rise in a lack of a meta narrative there's no you as an individual have many different identities you're a fan of this popular culture but you're also a parent but you're also you know a a sports junkie but you're also somebody involved in local politics you you have these different identities um, that really defeat the the power of the meta narrative and the, for many of us we see that as a good thing um, because it does give rise to it does give power to the individual it does recognize the complexity of each and every person in all the ways in which their lives exist uh, so what we see here is you know we maintain multiple identities roles and self perceptions and more importantly these are flexible in time space bodies and mind that is these will change they're not static I think that's one of the big things about postmodernism is that there is an extremely dynamic world and individuals are extremely dynamic you know think about yourself who you are today are you the same person you were 10 years ago or are you the same person you were last year what are those different roles that you now take up what are the different roles you will take up and how does that change your self-perception so ultimately what we're dealing with is unstable grounding uh, that is postmodernism knows and, and embraces this this unstable grounding that you know we have this incohesion of time and space and I think the internet is a great example never in the history of the world have we been able to play around with time and space so much we can have conversations that are asynchronous that is out of time right I can post something on a discussion board and somebody else can come along and post it and somebody else can come along and post it so we're playing around with the ability to discuss in time we're also playing around with space right I can talk to somebody on the other side of the world I can see them I can see rep you know I can see them on a Google Hangout and so that changes or that makes the world not as concrete and as, as finite as we used to think of it and that things happen increasingly faster right if we look at well just look at the cell phone you know if we look at other technologies you can see you know something like how long it took the printing press to to catch on and to be as popular as it was took a couple hundred years the cell phone it took 20 right we see cell phones rise in the in the 19 in the 1990s and now they're ubiquitous virtually everyone in the US has a cell phone now clearly not everybody does but they are ubiquitous we expect people now to have cell phones right we always ask people oh what's your cell phone right it's just so common and yet I mean that happened so fast compared to you know previous uh, previous technologies being introduced and we have large troubles answering the question where are you from we've become a highly mobile society and what do we mean where are you from do we mean where are you from geographically do we mean where are you from culturally do we mean where are you from economically do we mean where are you from educationally you know that where are you from you know when you were five years old because for some of us you know where we lived when we were four years old versus where we live in ten years old and what does that mean what does it mean to say I, I was you know I'm from Florida but I only lived in Florida for four years does that what kind of weight does that hold and so with all of this one challenge is that we get uncertain realities and I think a good example of this was with President Obama and the repeated dialogue despite lack of you know what we can say is lack of proof of is you know was President Obama a Muslim is he a citizen is he a socialist right repeatedly these ideas were fought down and yet they still held sway so much though that even in 2011 three years after being elected 
over a third of the nation thought he was a Muslim, right? Even though he'd been going to church for decades, uh, there was still a strong viewpoint that thought he was a Muslim. So that's one of the challenges of postmodernism is it creates these uns uncertain realities and that truth becomes much harder to communicate. Right? And we see this all the time. Uh, you know, Many of us have posted something on Facebook only to find out by somebody else that, uh, no, that's not true. Uh, in fact, that's, that's misinformation on, that's being posted. So trying to hold on to or know what truth is becomes increasingly problematic. So ultimately what we deal with is instability is the new stability, right? And that's at the center of postmodernism is that there's so much change going on. It's a continual, you know, it's fascinating to try to see how that affects us, how that changes how we identify and what we think about and what we privilege in our popular culture. All right, that's all for now. Thank you very much. See you in the next video.